Jesus, I am so in love with you. And I'm standing on a dune. Yes, I'm standing on a dune. Yes, I'm standing on a dune. Jesus. Yes, I stand in all of you. And I let my words be free. Jesus, I am so in love with you. And I Simplest of all love songs I want to bring to you So I'll let my words be few Jesus, I am so in love with you Yes, I'll stand chapter 5 different chords I heard this morning in Pam's song and, and then in Jimmy's song uh, music it's amazing and uh, blessed to be led in worship through the piano guitar Luke 5 let's pray Jesus, here we are, and you are here as well. If we follow you, if we've surrendered our heart to you, you're with us always. This is not your house. You don't hang out here during the week. You go with us. I just ask this morning, you show up as you want to show up. Maybe you're going to show up cracking a joke. Because you certainly did that when you walked among us. And I pray that we would not miss what you're trying to say through your scripture, through your gospel. Get me out of your way. Help us hear the good news. In your name I pray. Amen. I cannot get enough of the living, breathing biography of Jesus Christ, otherwise known as the gospels. One of my favorite questions somebody will ask me, usually a new Christian. Where should I start reading? And I'm like, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and then repeat. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, over and over again. I've just finished reading those four books, and I'm reading through the Bible this year, and I'm in the book of Acts now, and probably you're going to finish around December, first of December, not the book of Acts, but the whole Bible. But I am just continually blown away by Jesus. 
There's one eternal truth about Jesus that is often overlooked, and it is this. His was and is a shattering presence. If he was with us today, some of us wouldn't like him very well, or we wouldn't like him all the time because he'd get agitated. We'd get agitated. He said things. Everywhere he went, he did the most unpredictable things. He said the most uncomfortable words. He performed the most unconventional miracles. Everywhere, there was broken. Jesus got smack dab in the middle of it. Like a bull in our little china shop of religion. We love religion. <laughs> we do. And Jesus just comes in and says, I'm not having any of your religious. You're not going to put me in a box. If you read the Gospels, you realize he levels individuals <laughs> with his truth and his love. He topples every babbling tower of cult, denomination, and creed. You consider the trail of flattened individuals he left in his wake. A man named Nicodemus came to see Jesus at night. Jesus told him, Nick, you need to be born again. Scripture says that Nick departed Jesus' presence in consternation. Rich, rich young ruler came to him one night. It says he went away sorrowful because of what Jesus told him. A woman at the well was so mesmerized by what Jesus told her, she left her water pot, went back to her community. She abandoned not only her water pot, but her shame, where she went back to her community. She was considered a disreputable person to invite all her judgmental neighbors out to Meet this man out at the well. <laughs> Another sinful woman was so literally floored by Jesus' tremendous grace and upon collapsing at his feet, she washed them with his tears and dried them with her hair. And then the religious people, the Pharisees, Jesus constantly angered them to the point that they couldn't take it anymore and they had him murdered. This morning we're going to look at it the account of Peter, Peter's calling to follow Jesus. And I want to point this out. This story, these stories, the gospel is true. All of these stories are true. We are sometimes become so over-familiar with these stories. Yeah, kind of lump them in the same category, especially if we were introduced to these stories through vacation Bible school when we were little children. We lump them in the same category as other stories we heard when we were children. But these stories are true. And there is that air of mystery about them. One of my favorite gospel writers is Luke. He adds so much detail, and he certainly does here in the calling of the first disciples, the calling of Peter. Beginning with verse 1 of chapter 5, Luke 5. It says, One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret with the people crowding around him and listening to the word of God, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So Jesus got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down in the boat and taught the people from the boat. So the first thing in this encounter is Jesus got into Simon's boat. Simon and the other fishermen are out of their boats, they're trying to wash their nets. This had to be made difficult by this gathering crowd that was pressing Jesus against the edge of the water. Jesus gets into his boat. Jesus asked Simon to put out a little from the shore. I want to point out here, Jesus steps into Simon's boat before he asks the favor. A little presumptuous, almost could be considered rude. But then if you back up the chapter before, you realize, well, they do have a history here because over at Simon's house, probably just a few days before this, Jesus healed Simon's mother-in-law of a fever. So they at least knew each other. Jesus steps into Simon's boat. This is an intentional act on Jesus' part. Verse 4, when Jesus had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. So not only does Jesus get into Simon's boat, he gets into Simon's comfort zone. He got into his business. When Jesus got into 
Simon's boat, he asks a favor. But now, when he gets into Simon's area of expertise, Jesus makes a command. A little bit different than a favor. He makes a command. Put out in the deep water. I believe Simon Peter, an experienced fisherman, I think he was humoring Jesus here. Didn't really know him very well yet. What does a carpenter know about fishing? And I believe with Simon's tongue in his cheek, he said, hi, hi, Captain. We've been out fishing all night. We haven't caught a blessed thing. And the best time to fish, everybody knows, is at night. And near the shore, that's the best place to fish. But because you say, go out here in the middle of the day, go out in the deep water. Because you say so, boss, yeah, we'll go out to deep water. And we'll give it a try. And just how long have you been a fisherman, Jesus? <laughs> okay. So off they go. Out into deep water. They cast their nets. And all halibut broke loose. Well, not halibut, but sardines, barbels, and mushed. Those are the type of fish, fish you'll find in the Sea of Galilee. It says, when they had done so, verse 6, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. <laughs> Jesus got into Simon's boat. Jesus got into Simon's comfort zone and all halibut breaks loose. Their nets began to break. Their boats began to sink. This is a broken moment and Jesus is right smack dab in the middle of it. As a matter of fact, Jesus is the cause of it. He is creating this chaos. If Jesus had just let them be, their boats would not be sinking in deep water. And their nets would have been repaired and clean for another night of mediocre fishing. And yet there's Jesus watching this unfold. And I think he has a smile on his face. This calamity is happening. He's not being malicious, though. He's just realizing something they don't know yet. He knows what he's about to do. He's been intentional every step along the way. I mean, come on. There, there are now two boatloads overladen with flopping silver. Nets are tearing. Boats are taking on water. Fishermen are frantically attempting to simultaneously salvage the catch and their vessels. Everything begins to break at once. Does that sound familiar? Everything begins to break at once. Their livelihood began to break. Familiar? Their expectations began to break. Their plans began to break. I canceled my third trip this year that I intended to take. One would have been enough for me, but I kept canceling them and kept planning. Plans began to break. Their safe, comfortable world as they knew it began to break. Do I need to even say 2020? <laughs> and then Simon Peter broke. Their nets began to break. They began to sink. Verse 8, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away. Go away. Go away from me. Lord, I am a sinful man. You don't know whose boat you're standing in. You don't know the kind of person I am. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. The nets are ripping. They are so full. The boat is foundering. It is so full. And Simon is coming apart. He is so full. He is so full of awe and wonder 
just like Jimmy sang about a few moments ago. Wonder gripped him. Wonder held him round. He's full of awe and wonder. He is so full of fear. He is so full of shame, humiliation, and unworthiness. I think Eugene Peterson hits the nail on the head in the message when he paraphrases what Peter said here. Master, leave. I'm a sinner and I can't handle this holiness. Leave me to myself. Go away. You are better at what I do than I am. I don't know if you had the opportunity to listen to that song I sent this morning from Ross King. I hope you did. I love the, the, the lyrics that Ross writes. Poor fishermen. Rich fishermen. Poor fishermen again. You know, there's poor fishermen. We didn't catch anything. Rich fishermen. Now our boats are loaded. Poor fishermen again. One miracle, impossible, nets bursting full, and then down on his knees, humiliation. Doesn't seem like much of a salvation. Brings to mind the thought-provoking question, that's why I'm asking, why did Peter say, go away? Why did he say, go away? What am I to learn from these forgotten words? Why did Jesus call a heart that was afraid? Why did Peter say, go away? Have you ever told Jesus to go away? Maybe not Jesus, maybe God. Go away, I'm, I'm too messed up. I'm too embarrassed. I'm too far gone. Or maybe it was more like, go away, I'm mad at you right now. It's okay to be mad at Jesus, by the way. You don't need my permission, but you have permission. It's okay to be mad at God. I think sometimes we try to bury a lot of our anger with God, and, and it's just bottled up inside of us, and God already knows it's there. <laughs> he's, he, he's, he's not missing your anger. He knows it's there. Let it out. Let him have it. He can handle it. He's not going to walk away from you. Maybe we tell Jesus, go away. You're making me mad. I don't like what you said. You would not do what I asked you to do. I prayed to you and I didn't get the answer I wanted. Or maybe it's like, go away. I don't believe in you. I don't believe in you. There's a, there's a generation, generations following us, and that's their response to Jesus right now. And it's not so much their response to Jesus, I'm afraid. It's the response to the Jesus they see in and through the church. Go away. I don't believe in you. I thought about my salvation moment. I didn't tell Jesus to go away in my salvation moment when he saved me as a 10-year-old boy up in Otago County. There had been a lot leading up to that, but I, I, I was open. There's a Michael W. Smith song that reminds me a lot of my attitude back then. It's called Missing Person. You know, There was a boy who had faith to move a mountain and he would believe without a reason. And that was me. And then when God called me into the ministry when I was 17 years of age, I didn't tell him go away then. I'd heard too many stories about my grandfather Sprouse who did tell God to go away, ran from God and God's call. And God had to discipline Pop Sprouse until finally he was age 50 and he surrendered to God's call for his life. But I embraced it. I didn't tell God to go away then. But there was a time when I did tell God to go away. Towards the end of my two years of dwelling crippled and broken, I had a realization one day and I told God to go away. I had just spent part of my day in Dr. Robert Smith Jr.'s office at Beeson Divinity School, Sanford. And I had returned to the hotel where I was staying there in Pelham. And I was on the, the exercise machine there at the hotel, walking. And, and I was slowly processing the last two years of my life. And it was when the light bulb came on. And, there, and I don't, I talk about this from time to time. I try not to overdwell on this, but it's a huge part of my story. And I sometimes think maybe I, I hit on it so lightly that folks do not realize, don't have any comprehension what those two years were like for me. 
two years of my life were caught in a broken trap. And I thought about the stages of grief that I had gone through when my wife left me. Two years later, I'm thinking about this on this treadmill. And the first, I, I know the stages. I didn't see them at the time. I couldn't have broken them down for you, but I knew the first stage was this. It was that arrow coming and hitting me, striking me full force out of nowhere. Oh, I did not see that coming. Did not see coming the fact that she was going to leave. That was in February, and that hit me right there. Just, mm. And I felt that for months until September. And then came the knife in my back where I, I realized I've been betrayed. There's more to this story than I realized. So I'm mm, here, I'm mm, here. And that went to the end of 2011. My wife had a heart attack in 2011. I prayed over her, my family, for the three weeks down in Orlando. Came back to Texas in 2012. And for the next nine months, it was like an enemy standing over me every day. <coughs> Pounding me. I know what the devil smells like. I can actually smell the stench of a lion. He appears as a roaring. He appears as a, as a lion. He's not a lion, the lion of Judah. Maybe I was really smelling the lion of Judah. But I know what it feels like to have an enemy stand over you, pounding you down day after day after day. That was step, stage three. Stage four, sometime along about October of 2012, God began to give me a reserve of strength. I did not know I had to stand. And I knew there was a stand coming that I was going to have to make. And that stand indeed came the day I walked into a courthouse in November 2012 and realized, uh-oh, I'm standing before a judge who's about to, about to hit the gavel on a divorce. And I had to even ask the judge because he was about to do it. And I said, excuse me, do I get a chance to speak? I'm standing there. And he says, yeah, if you don't say something now. And so God gave me, he prepared me to say some things that needed to be said. And now we're part of the court record. This is not God's will. That was among other things that I said, but God gave me the strength. He knew that was coming. I had the strength. And then the last stage was I felt like an empty sack hanging on a barbed wire fence. I was spent when I walked out of that courthouse. And for some reason, as I'm processing all that on that treadmill that day, Galatians 2.20 came to mind, and I never I never compared what I had gone through for two years to that cross right there. But suddenly I saw all the dynamics of it. Struck. Jesus was struck. He knew it was coming. I didn't. Struck and then knifed in the back by betrayal of one of his own. Really all 12 of them betrayed him. But Judas is the one that gets the, the heaviest account of blame. Struck in the back with a knife and then beaten. He was beaten by the Roman guards. Slapped, spit, they played games with him. He was finally nailed. He was beaten, taken to the cross, put upon the cross, but then he had enough strength seven times to raise up on a nail and declare some words that needed to be spoken. And then it is finished. And he collapsed. And I realized all those steps that I'd gone through, those five steps, it's just like a crucifixion. And Galatians 2.20 came to my mind on that treadmill. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of Man who loved me and gave himself for me. And I recall that verse from memory, and I thought to myself, go away. I don't want to be crucified with you, Jesus. I don't want what you want. Simon Peter told Jesus, go away. I told Jesus, go away. Perhaps you have told Jesus, go away. <laughs> well, I've got some good news for all of us. If you read the next verse, you realize Jesus didn't go away. It's one prayer he didn't answer. Go away. Yet Jesus doesn't go away. And now again, I see the humor in this moment. 
Simon Peter has fallen at Jesus' knees. That's where scripture says he is. He has fallen, get this, into a sinking boatload of frantic fish who are gasping to adjust to an atmosphere not created for them. A whole boatload of fish flopping. Yet these fish have been part of the miracle. They were summoned by Jesus' supernatural voice to take part in the redemption of a broken man. This man wasn't having any of it. No, no thank you. Go away. He's invited Jesus to get lost, even though Jesus was the only one found at that moment. And Jesus doesn't go away. He stays. He doesn't even flinch. He stands in Simon's brokenness. He stands in Simon's submerging boat. And I imagine a pause here. You've got to allow pauses in Scripture. Sometimes just in our imagination, but you've got to realize some of the things said, there's got to be more than just, boom, on to the next verse. I imagine a pause here that is so loud you can hear crickets. <laughs> Simon has invited Jesus to leave. Jesus doesn't respond to the offer. I think all fish eyes were on Simon at this moment. Dude, just do what he wants so we can get back in the water. <laughs> and then Jesus speaks. He speaks truth and encouragement and hope. And he shows compassion and love and grace. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. I will make you a fisher of men. This is not about your sinking boat or your bursting net or your busted pride or your storm surge of shame or your drowning fear. This is about me, Peter, and this is about you. This is about your need and my provision. This is about your broken and my redemption. This is a moment for me to set some things right in you. I believe that's why we run from brokenness. Back when I was a revivalist, I would do spiritual renewal weekends for churches, five messages over a weekend. And one of the five messages. I was encouraging people. I was encouraging believers to embrace broken. Broken's coming. When it comes, embrace it. I was encouraging that before the greatest broken I had ever experienced in my life came. And when it came, it was hard for me to heed the own, my own message that God had given me or the message that God had spoken through me. It wasn't my message. I believe that's why we run from brokenness. 2020. We've been saying for years, 2020 vision. And I think it's part of why we've been so amped up to get to 2020. Oh, we're gonna, oh, it's gonna be such a banner year. 2020, how can it not be, right? And what we did not understand in our own lives is that our vision is so out of whack. Our vision is so messed up that what God is doing right now is getting our vision back straightened out. But we are resisting him because we don't like what we're going through to get our priorities restrained. And I'm afraid we're still fighting him. Evidence, anything I see on social media, everybody's still in their own camp. Politically, racially, we've got a lot of stuff that we need to allow Jesus to surrender this broken season to him and say, get our focus back as it ought to be because I'll tell you the way it was before 2020 began, we were out of line. The church was out of line. Believers were out of line. We become so politically motivated. We look to our religious leaders to tell us how to vote. I'm telling you, I'm not voting for Trump. I'm not voting for Biden. I will vote, but neither of those two individuals will get my vote. 
But why? Because my hope is not in a political candidate. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. But I will not vote. For years we have said, what's the lesser of two evils? So we have just admitted we're voting for evil. That's the world system. We don't have to think like that. We don't have to respond like that. We do not have to play their game. It's their game. I'm not playing it. I pray and ask God to guide. We've got to get our hearts set back on him, our focus on him. I believe this is why we run for brokenness. When my wife left me, I had a friend of mine who had the audacity. He, he either told me or he texted me, and I did not like this message, but he said, he told me this. He said, Robert, this is not about her. This is about you and God. And it was. God moved on me pretty quickly. And he said, Robert, we're going to talk about some things. And you know what? It's almost been 10 years and, and, and he's still talking. <laughs> I believe this is why we run from brokenness. We don't want the exposure of our souls to the purity of his truth and the flame of his love. Because his purity sears us. And his love burns all the unnecessaries we cling to in this life. And that's all the world has to offer us is unnecessaries. But I'm here to tell you this morning, brokenness is a good place for Jesus to climb into your boat. For when we are broken, we recognize our greatest need. It's not our political candidate in office. It's not the best job we've ever had in our career. It's not for everything to go back to whatever normal we were living prior to all of this. Our greatest need is following him. Being a kingdom follower in a world that is upside down to his kingdom. From the very beginning of Simon's association with Jesus, Simon Peter recognized and acknowledged who he was without Jesus, a sinful man. Simon knew his sin was his greatest problem. And all of this came bubbling to the surface of Simon's life in the presence of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. A.B. Simpson in his Christ in the Bible commentary writes this. He says, there need be no discouragement in this deep consciousness of our unworthiness. It will but make larger room for God himself and bring us into closer sympathy with weak and sinful men. Back when broken worship gathering was still meeting back in 2017 it was amazing to me how many people could not wrap their head around that term broken <laughs> running from it you know i'm not broken i even had one individual tell me and i'm here to tell you brokenness over our sin is a good thing i'm not talking about groveling in it wallowing in it but i'm talking about recognizing every single day you are broken we live in a broken world and you and i are part of the brokenness that's a good thing because it is in that precise moment of brokenness when we cry out to Jesus in our need, our need to have our sins forgiven, our need to be made right with God. And I don't know about you, but that's a continual need with me, okay? Our need to enter into a relationship with Jesus if you don't have one yet. It is in that moment that we enter the kingdom of God. Jesus was in Peter's boat, but Peter was not yet in Jesus' boat until he recognized who he, was, who he was before God and before Jesus Christ. And when he confessed his sin and acknowledged his need, then he began his relationship with Jesus as his true follower. There's a line in the song I sent you this morning. It's on the bridge says, God gives grace to the humble, and God gives the earth to the meek, and we want to run into his kingdom 
with our heads held high on our own two feet. In other words, we want to come to Jesus, but we're still in control. And we want to come to Jesus, but we're still saving this right here, saving face. If you have never experienced such brokenness displayed by Peter over your sinful condition, then I have to wonder if you have ever entered the kingdom of God. Because brokenness is how we enter a relationship with Jesus. And it's how we stay in one, too. It's how we follow him. Because if you read the Gospels, this is one of the brightest things Peter ever said. Go away. <laughs> he stuck his foot in his mouth from here on out most of the time. Verse 11, so they pulled their boats up to shore, left everything, and followed him. Simon Peter left his comfort zone that day. Simon Peter left his safe space. He left his self behind. He left his sins behind as he knew them that day. He left everything and followed Jesus. Because you can't successfully carry all that stuff. All your baggage, all your comfort, all your self, all your sin. You can't successfully carry all that stuff and successfully follow Jesus at the same time. Peter said, go away. Jesus said, go fish. Let's pray. Father, you know what you want of each one of us. And I pray that we would be obedient to your call. In your name I pray. Amen.